I try not to be just a booktuber. I understand that there's a legitimate genre, subgenre of YouTubers, but I, uh, I try not to just review books, partly because, well, there's some things that can't be covered that I want to kind of wander on about in a book review, and also because I don't want to always encourage my own consumption or your own consumption. But the truth is, I'm an addict, and I get at least a weekly fix at William James Books in beautiful downtown nowhere. And I bought a couple of books recently that uh, I'm going to tube about. I bought this one because living here at the edge of nowhere in the non-zone, I... Uh, I want to encourage Paul, who owns the bookstore these days, to to buy books uh, uh, about the Bible and other Christian topics, and to assure him that he'll have at least one one customer in uh, little old me. And this book had been sitting there for a very long time, and so. One day I thought, oh, I should give that book a home. You know, it's kind of nice to know the history of the Bible in English. There's the book plate of my local, local supplier. And it's a big old book. And I haven't read all of it. And I've been a little bit surprised, although I shouldn't be, I suppose, at how marvelously Protestant this book is. <laughs> you know, its chapter on the Dewey Reen's Bible mostly points out the mistakes. And then I had bought this book because I thought it would help me to to make peace of a sort with Baroque and Rococo architecture. I actually am one who thinks that the uh, Basilica of St. Peter is one of the ugliest buildings around. Grand, imposing, but ugly. But what I have found in this book is that it actually, actually covers a lot more than just the Vatican as the building, but the Vatican as an institution, as well as an art collector, and many other things. But as I have read these books, I, I came upon uh, a thought that is the subject, really, of this video, and that is how limited my grasp of history so often is. Now, this shouldn't surprise me. History is a lot bigger than the both of us. I remember when I was, I guess, a junior in college, uh, being assigned a book by Basil Willie called 18th Century Backgrounds, 283 pages. That's not enough pages to do a thorough job of covering the 18th century background. But it was kind of a sort of neo-Marxist history that would lead up to Marx and and uh, and uh, the thought of the 19th century, so it did what it was supposed to. But history is, I say, bigger than both of us. I, I taught for a while uh, American history at a snooty, snooty Episcopal high school, and uh, for girls, and the classes were small, so I had three three sections of American history and one lunchtime. Some of the girls came and said they they wanted to complain to me. And I said, sure. And they said, well, we like to study together. And I said, oh, that's a good thing. And they said, but the problem with studying together is that our notes don't match. 
you don't say the same thing in every section. And I said, well, no, I don't. And the reason is I bore easily. And I have to listen to all three lectures. You're fortunate. You each only have to listen to one. So I vary my lectures so I don't go to sleep. Well, in a sense, these two books are different lectures on, at least in part, the 16th century, which was a biggie. Now, the 15th century, of course, was kind of important as well. In uh, 1453, Constantinople fell to the Turks. And in 1455, Gutenberg printed the first, the first printed edition of the Bible. But there were a lot of things going on in the 16th century, like the uh, development of sort of a definitive edition of the English Bible. And the building of the new St. Peter's Basilica that are, I think, interesting reflections on each other and connected in a ways that I don't always notice. Now, how interconnected are they? Well, it was the Renaissance, after all, and everybody had new, new learning floating about, and there was a uh, copying of... Uh, of uh, classical styles of architecture and of course also reading of Aristotle again the reading of Aristotle which would lead to struggles over what happened in the mass transubstantiation and the like and of course there was a somewhat direct connection in that one of the ways of uh, funding the construction of the new New St. Peter's uh, was with selling indulgences and that of course did not go down well with a number of folks including famously Martin Luther. Now the translation of the definitive English version of the Bible commonly called the King James Version can sort of trace its origin back to 1525 when William Tyndall published his first New Testament and the beginnings of the building of the new St. Peter's can kind of be traced back to 1503 when Pope Julius II decided it was time to replace the old St. Peter's. And both of them would be works that couldn't be completed by by one man and there would be a number of different translators uh, who would work on what would become the King James Bible which uh, proudly stands in the Tyndale tradition and there would be a number of architects of course who would work on St. Peter's before it reached its final final uh, incarnation with the Bernini Plaza but I think what I realized reading these books is that they are reflections on the, the resurgence, the renaissance, as it were, of two forms of religion, which in Judaism were called uh, the Sadducees and the Pharisees and which in Christianity can be the uh, Protestants and the Catholics. And of course there are overlaps. But the Protestants, like the Pharisees, were working on a sort of English Talmud. Now, you know, this is a very uh, lingo-centric video. And there were translations of the Bible into other European languages, some of them earlier 
than English. There was a French version, an old French version in the 13th century, and then the sort of definitive French version in 1530. There had been a translation into Italian in 1471, and the Spanish were right smack in the 16th century with a tr translation in 1568, which sort of gives lie to the fact that the church always opposed translation of the Bible into the vernacular. What they wanted was a good translation that taught what the church taught. And as I say, Mr. Daniel is happy to point out that the Dewey Reims translation taught what the church taught, and that was a bad thing. Now, you know, what is fascinating, well, there are a number of things fascinating, but whether you experience the gospel, experience the message, shall we say, to be sort of short of <laughs> a short version of Christianity, best by reading or by experiencing. And it's fascinating, I think, that both of these projects, the building of a, a new temple for the Sadducees so that the high priest would have a, a really great stage to do his thing, or the uh, publication of a definitive version of Scripture. Let's dig up. I have a a replica uh, facsimile of the 1611 text so that the rabbi would have a definitive text on which to preach and argue were the product of the 16th century and its return to classical ancient sources. The church, of course, would claim the antiquity of Peter, and the, the Protestants would claim the antiquity of the Bible. And both of these projects have continued into the future. Right now, for instance, uh, the great uh, columns of the Bernini Baldacchino are being restored, and the bronze in those columns was stolen, well, that's not the right word, is it, stripped from the porch of the Pantheon, and the King James edition of the Bible would, of course, use much of what Tyndale had, had translated, but you couldn't say it was Tyndale because he'd been burned at the stake. Either way, finally in 1610, the nave of St. Peter's was finished, and in 1611, the King James Version would, would be published. And, of course, they've all continued over the years to be refined and revised. At the Vatican, there is the new All the Six Audience Hall. But uh, the latest, I guess, installment of the Tyndale tradition is the New Revised Standard Version Updated Edition. And I suppose one has to say something about the changes that are going on here in the 21st century, with many people claiming that the, the translations of the New Revised Standard Version Updated Edition uh, betray the tradition of the church or indeed go back to pagan practices and even as we speak they're winding up in Rome their synod and synodality and many people argue that there's a betrayal of the traditions of the church but whether those are betrayals or not, both, both uh, the folks who are concerned with the translations of the Bible, the folks who are concerned with the 
encyclicals and proclamations alike from the Vatican still go back to this understanding of whether the church is a is a can best be represented perhaps expressed in physicality or in words i um had a comment from a young friend saying, well, we ain't supposed to make images. But I pointed out that Paul said that Christ is the very image of God. And if we can have an image of God, can we not have an image of the city of God? And can we not try to build a replica of that city? Or, if Christ is the Word made flesh, can we not have the best version possible of that Word? And these, I think, are a continu continuation and continuity with the Pharisaical understanding of, um, of Judaism, made uh, necessary by, in some ways by the fact that there was only one one temple, the one in Jerusalem, and so the people out in the countryside had to deal with uh, figuring out things as best they could from reading the text. And those who say, yes, proper worship only happens in the temple, and uh, you have to <laughs> you have to come here. And of course, there's funds to be raised in both cases. The um, Roman Catholic Church in England, for instance, is revising its lectionary, replacing their new Eng their Jerusalem Bible translation in the Missal with the revised, pardon me, the English Standard Version, a version that's based on Tyndale, ultimately, and the. Um, the Vatican, and, and that will raise a lot of money. I forget how much it's going to cost each parish, but it ain't cheap. And one of the reasons the Vatican is uh, restoring the Baldacino is that it is a holy year, a good time to come to the temple and pay your taxes. Well, those are my thoughts on the 16th century, and... Uh, it's kind of a doesn't begin to exhaust what we could say about those turbulent times, but it does strike me that the, the developments are are parallel and a fascinating, if somewhat contradictory, method. And I would be happy to hear what you have to say uh, as well. I could quite figure out what sort of colic to end this this uh, video with, I decided I would choose one that is um, very Roman Catholic, but which Protestants would, Protestants would probably agree with, and it is from the pre-Vatican II Mass for Pentecost. O God, who on this day did instruct the hearts of the faithful by the light of the Holy Spirit, grant us by the same Holy Spirit to relish what is right and ever to rejoice in his consolation. Through Jesus, through our Lord Jesus Christ, thy Son, who liveth and reigneth with thee in the unity of the same Holy Ghost, God, world without end. Amen. Well, thanks for watching.